So let me show you what I've uploaded so far. Assignment two is going to cover the era of the 1820s to the 1910s. Assignment two won't be due till October 12th. And I might play with that date a day or two here, but so you have a little less than a month to do assignment two. So judging from you all, you'll probably, you know, October 9th or, 9th or so, you're going to start to engage in it. I highly recommend you don't start earlier, right? Or else you'll just be in this crazy mad rush. Um, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. So <clears throat> there's going to be also about three chapters I assigned for this. Uh, the first chapter is going to come from historian Benjamin Madley's book. Benjamin Madley wrote a book a couple years ago uh, from Yale University Press called An American Genocide, the United States and the California Indian Catastrophe. And we were lucky enough to have him come join us last October. Yeah, we hosted him, we mean Shasta College and other folks, hosted him at the Cascade Theater. And uh, if you scroll down further, you're going to see a link to his hour-long lecture, which is very powerful. He's a very powerful speaker, and the subject matter is very powerful. <clears throat> um, he's also from the recently burned-out town of Happy Camp. That's where he grew up, right on the Klamath River. So he's a local boy now uh, living at UCLA, writing books. So here's one chapter, right, that you all be reading, California Indians Before 1846. Right, and this is what I'll post today, my lecture, California of the 1820s, and so on. Sound good? So the, <clears throat> the model for assignment two is going to be the same as assignment one. Okay, assignment one. There's assignment two right there. There we go. <clears throat> Oh, objectives for assignment two, just what I hope you get out of it. Uh, there's the assignment two. All the questions and materials are right there and you submit it right there. Here's the discussion post and replies. And here's the extra credit. <clears throat> Any questions about that? Or should we roll on with some actual history? History? All right. Where is that? So this is the lecture, California, the 1820s. Let me show you this. So these questions I posted already on Canvas. If you want to quickly write them down or take a picture of them or something, because this is what I'm going to hope to uh, convey some information about right here. Uh, what strikes you how California Indians tended the wild is the first question. The second question, overall, what are three, three, three things that strike you about California Indians before 1846? Third question, what are three things that strike you about the missions? And along with that, what was the mission of the missions? I also include places in the chapter because remember these four questions, not only will you get the information from the lecture, but you'll get the info from the Benjamin Madley um, PDF chapter I uploaded. And finally, what strikes you about the life and rebellion of Istanislao? What uh, was there and other California Indian rebellions justified? Okay. Sound good? Ready to go? So first of all, what do you all know about California Indians? What do you all bring to the table? Any information, knowledge? Do you learn anything in eighth grade or sophomore year about California Indians? Justin, Emma, Monique, or Lee? No, Monique? Okay. There were hundreds of tribes in the state alone. Yeah, there was hundreds of different ethno-linguistic groups of people. Exactly. It was. California had the most diverse group of native peoples in North America. The most deserve, uh, diverse. Emma, what do you come to the table with? Anything about California Indians? Um, I just know that, well, I guess, I suppose Northern California native people were some of the last to be colonized just because they were so hard to get around to. Just, we were like the longest secluded area 
away from like any European invaders. Yeah, and the um, and this book here that this this canonical new book, meaning very important new book. The last chapter is about um, the Modoc Wars and Captain Jack's defeat in the Modoc Wars in the 1870s. So you're right. Northern California natives were the last to be um, conquered, invaded, right, colonized. Good point. Justin, how about you? Anything from anything bringing to the table? Uh, not really. I don't know much about. Uh, oh, no worries. That's why you're here. Welcome. Now let me yeah. try to do my job. And again, interrupt me anytime I get so bored of hearing myself talk. <clears throat> um, as we were, and is this big enough for you all to see? I know you might have different devices. Some of y'all might have phones. Some of you might have. Is this big enough to see this map? The point I want to get across in this map is this is a map. Um, of the different ethno-linguistic groups in North America. So within each big color area, there are different dialects of that language spoken, right? So there's diversity within these big colored areas. However, go ahead. Okay. However, look how diverse California is and Oregon, right? Look how many different color schemes there are here versus like Utah, right? These, I have a these, question. Uto Aztecan. Yes, sir. Justin. Um, what technically like makes uh, something its own distinct language versus like a dialect? All right. <clears throat> All these different groups, like say the green group right here, Uto Aztecan, that's like saying um, Latin-based languages. Like how many Latin-based languages do we have? We have Italian, French, English, kind of. English borrows from all sorts of places. Portuguese, Catalan. So each um, color represents like a root language in which there are different various um, other languages within that. Is that confusing enough explanation? It's fairly confusing, yeah. Um, yeah. What I mean is that like, is there much, because I mean like certain place like uh, Brazil, like with Portuguese, Portuguese, right? Like I know that people who speak Portuguese kind of understand Spanish like a little bit and people understand yeah, Spanish. Exactly. Understand. They all have Latin roots. So they would yeah. all one color. If we were looking at a map of the world, all the Latin based languages would be say one color. And since I speak Spanish, I can understand Portuguese if they speak slow. I can understand Italian if they speak slow, right? It helps a lot. Great question. Does that make sense, Justin? Yeah, it does. Okay. <clears throat> In California, as in California, as um, Lee, who came and went, said about seventy-five different ethno-linguistic groups. I know Lee used the word tribe, and that's fine too. Um, but ethno-linguistic groups, I think, is much more specific about what it means to be a different part of the group. For example, this yellow color is based on the root language of Penutian. Panushan, exactly the question Justin was asking. Okay. <clears throat> this Al Algonquian language over here are these dark brown groups over there. And so on. Right. And these are the folks who are getting burnt right now. Well, there's a lot of fires everywhere, but the Happy Camp fires up in the uh, Wyatt area right around here and the Shasta area. Right, and here's our area that overlaps the Shasta and the Wintu. Right, Redding's right about here, right at the cut or the vortex of all these different areas. So in other words, Calif uh, Native Californians were a very diverse lot. And why do you think so? Let me ask you, why do you think there was such a high diversity in this part of California specifically? Let me just, what, what do you know about this cal part of California, Northwest? Go ahead, Monique, Emma, Justin, or Lee, just chime in. What's unique about this area besides today it's like the center of pot growing? There's a huge diversity of uh, different, like. Um, but how do you explain that? What's one possible explanation? What do you know about the topography and geography of this area? There's a lot of mountains in the area that it would be very easy for um, different groups to be separated from one another and have less contact with each other, which would allow them to 
develop separately? Yeah, exactly. Monique hit the nail on the head, to use a construction metaphor. And also, because it was so, re so resource rich with deer and game and salmon, they didn't need, they did trade with other groups for sure, but they weren't dependent upon other, you know, folks within their ethno-linguistic group going far away and harvesting something far away, right? There was enough right there. Versus, right, the middle of Utah has a lot fewer resources, so groups had to travel further afield, therefore that green is bigger. That's a very oversimplified way of doing it, and I'm sure James Tate, our anthropologist, would be rolling his eyes, but that's my seven sentence version. Cool math, and I've already up uploaded those boring slides for you, so if you wanna just look at these at your leisure, right, without hearing me yak away, they're already on there. <clears throat> In addition, if you just look at the geographical, geographical area of North America, California Indians had 15% of the whole North American population, right? That's about 500,000 back in 1491. Interestingly, today, California's population is about 15% of the United States. So it's interesting, there's like a similar, similar population density in relation to the rest of North America in 1491 and today. However, another interesting fact, this part of Northeastern California was much more heavily populated then during the uh, Native American days than today, right? A lot more people lived up here then. Um, <clears throat> California peoples, it was noted by Europeans who observed them. They said, yeah, these California Indians are so diverse. Each group has like this different elaborate outfit, a different elaborate hairdo, a different unique way of dancing. Uh, early chroniclers, and if you're interested in any early chroniclers, like their writings and their commentary about California Indians, let me know. <clears throat> and they just commented about, oh my gosh, they're different dances, different headgear, different just this rich cultural life. These are the uh, Ohlone people, Ohlone people in the mission of San Jose. <clears throat> there was plenty of game, goods for gathering. Uh, California Indians did very little farming. The only farming that was done was in the very, very southeast of the state where the, uh, where the Colorado River rolls through, right today the current uh, Arizona-California border. Most other Native peoples did not farm in the traditional sense of planting a seed, right, tending, tending it, and then waiting for the harvest. Why is that? Were they just lazy, cave-dwelling hunt hunters and gatherers? Why didn't they do farming and just hunt game? What do you think? What do you think, Moni, Lee, Emma, or Justin? You said they were like <clears throat> mountainous, right? And I would guess the land wouldn't be necessarily the best for them. All right, you're saying they might find some geographical obstacles to find easy hunting? All right. Ding, ding. Okay, Lee, poor Leo's dead. Emma, what do you think? Why didn't they farm? Why didn't they just like hunt and gather? Oh, I would think they wouldn't farm if they didn't need to farm. They probably had enough resources that they could gather that farming just wasn't a necessity. I don't know if any of y'all have tried farming, but it's a lot of work. Emma hit the nail on the head. Um, they didn't need to farm. There was enough salmon in the stream. There was enough, eight, there were enough acorns in the trees. There was enough deer to hunt. They did not need to farm. You work a lot less if there's plenty of game and you hunt and gather. Okay. Before so, the Central Valley Project, wasn't uh, most of the land around here kind of unfarmable anyway? Um, the land where we live, the whole Central Valley where we live right now currently, uh, all right, right here from down there to up there, before we got into this crazy dam building project, right, in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, um, this whole thing was a wetland, underwater wetland right from way down here in the Tehachapi's all the way up here to Sacramento or to Reading. So what that wetland, provi wetland provided was um, a lot of refuge and environment for uh, waterfowl. So a bunch of birds, a bunch of animals, 
But once all the dams started to be built around here, right around the Sierras, damming up all the water, it dried out the Central Valley. And only then did California and California settlers begin to farm. Does that make sense? All right. And by the way, this is um, here's, oh, dang, what did I do? There it is. Are you all seeing my screen? Yeah. Okay. So this is the original um, painting done in the 1800s by a European has envisioned of it. Look at the look at the version of it that were in, that was in California school books. You see how you see what they did to the painting? They put a loincloth on. I'm like, no, nope, our kids can't handle it. Let's show him a doctored up version. All right. <clears throat> So there, there's your giggle, giggle for the day. The Chumash people in the Santa Barbara channel, I forget if it's your class, but we have a couple students from Santa Barbara. There, were, uh, there, were, there was and still is kind of very rich fishing in like the calm bay of the Santa Barbara channel. And look at the Chumash built this huge boat, right? And they'd go out fishing, right? They'd, they'd go out big fish fishing right this rich rich santa barbara channel the yurok people up on the klamath river right uh, right near the klamath river and throughout the klamath river watershed um, they would take whole redwood stands right whole redwood trees and make a canoe out of it right and this would be an ocean going canoe right that would last for generations if your family had a canoe man it was just your most most cherished thing and remember, they did not have access. They did not have access to metal tools. So do you see how they shaped and carved out the redwood? Yeah, using fire and stone, right? Burn it out and then carve it out using stone. One of my place, favorite places on the planet is this spit right at the mouth of the Klamath River, right? You can park right there. I'm only telling you all, okay, don't go, but if you wanna go, Go right there and you climb down and the spit is so beautiful. You can, you can swim in this part right here and there's seals and all kinds of animals that are almost as big as you. And, um, but if you go, be respectful because this is Yurok, prop, Yurok territory, right? This is reservation land, but they allow visitors to go on as long as they're respectful. On this Yurok land is this uh, dugout um, structure right here in which they smoke salmon at their annual September salmon smoking ceremony. I don't know if it's going this year, but if you ever get a chance to go, um, it's quite something. So still today, Yurok people are fishing this river and smoking their salmon at, for example, this structure here. Has anybody been to the mouth of the Klamath River? No? Okay. All right. Put it on your to-do list. Once the happy campfire goes away, the happy campfire is right about up there. <clears throat> um, why didn't they farm? Were they lazy? No, they just harvested. Do you all notice that this year there's big fat acorns on the oak trees? Yeah, if you go around and check out the oak trees, especially the um, live oak trees, they're huge, right? So right now is then when they would be harvesting and they're dropping off the trees everywhere. This is just one, the one I mentioned, one of 10 different species of oak. Um, and once you harvest the acorns, they could be stored. They were non-perishable. Nobody had to make acorn mush in elementary school. Because I know many, many students I've had in the past, if they went to school up here, in elementary school or something, you took acorns and made them into mush and had to eat it. So not so Emma, Justin, or Monique or Lee? No acorn mush in your past? Not that I remember. I was in school oh, yeah. a long time ago. Oh, so Justin, you did do it. And Monique, you did do it, you did it too? Oh, was it? I didn't do it. I, I didn't do it. Oh, okay. But Monique, you did? Yeah, in kindergarten, um, one of my classmates' grandmothers, I guess, was part of one of the Native American tribes in the area, and she brought us in some acorn mush. Did you eat it? Yeah, it was interesting. Interesting, what does that mean? <laughs> it was really bitter from what I remember. Like oh, I, yeah. kind of like, ew, this is gross. <laughs> yeah. 
basically a starch carbohydrate thing that is bitter and they would usually add berries to it or salmon to it. It would just be like a carbo base that you add stuff to. Thank you, Monique. We'll do that. Once we get back in our face-to-face, -face, I'll make some at school. Um, again, uh, Native California people were some of the most um, skilled at making these waterproof baskets. And these waterproof baskets are made of reeds, reeds from, um, reeds from the water. And they're some of the most um, wonderfully artistic made things around. If you go to like the Oakland Museum and like, wow, well, what's the coolest thing California Indians made and that they put behind a glass display would be these baskets. Okay, and here is a woman processing acorns as we speak. California natives had few warrior societies, not just because there were peaceful granola crunching hippies, not at all. There were uh, fights and skirmishes over territory, over family, over the normal everyday stuff, but there was nothing like the Aztecs or the Maya, right, or other, or the Inca warrior societies. There was not like one big centralized state that controlled the huge territory over here and they fought those folks. It was much more decentralized, small skirmishes. Um, anthropologists um, speculate that it was because there was just such an abundance of resources. Um, that's one of the reasons why there was this decentralized state. <clears throat> they also tame the wild, right? In Benjamin Madley books, he's gonna talk about this a bit. And Benjamin Madley's chapter on California is one of my favorite chapters about California Indians. I promise this is, um, it's gonna be must reading across California history classes from here out. So how did California Indians use fire to tame the landscape? Do any of you all know about that? If any of you all heard about that, especially given our, I hear the helicopter going right over my house right now. How do California Indians tame the landscape? Do you know Emma, Justin, Monique, or Lee? I, I mean, I've read a little bit about it, how they would burn out all of like the dry brush and everything so that there wasn't anything, like if there was a huge fire, it wouldn't really catch on anything. Exactly, right? They would burn out the undergrowth. They would try to control it. Sometimes these fires did go out of control. Right, there's a few examples like, right, a whole big area burns and they went, oops, didn't mean to do that. But <clears throat> this is an odd map. This is the west coast of California, right here. This is California. And the areas where you see the checkery stuff is where fire was used regularly. You know, this is a bad map. I'm not gonna use it in the future. In other words, they used it all the time. And an example of what it would look like when you use fire to burn out the undergrowth is something like this, right? I'm sure you all know if you like just go to the Shasta Trinities and go off some dirt road and try to go into the forest, it's just so covered in manzanita and underbrush and you can't go there without scraping everything up. However, if you regularly um, burn the underbrush, it's like this, right? It's much more open, right? It makes it a lot easier to hunt Right, um, in, in reality, geez, what's that plant whose seeds only germinate with fire? Oh, the uh, um, oak trees. There's a certain kind of oak, a live oak, I think, that only when there's fire do uh, the gene, uh, seeds germinate. The ash acts as fertilizer, and you know what? The big trees remain. That's why big trees have these big, thick bark at the bottom. That protects them from fire. And a forest with big trees with room between them is um, much healthier. And that's kind of like the opposite of what we have here, unfortunately. Questions or comments about that before we move on to the first European arrivals? If you go to a forest now, aren't a lot of the uh, like uh, undergrowth uh, plants you see non-native to this area anyway? Yeah, you know all those grasses with the seeds on top? Yeah, those, that's a European import. Manzanitas are local, oaks are local, um, the California coffee plant's local. Don't get, me, don't get me excited. I just downloaded this app on my phone. It's for free where you can point it at a plant. It'll tell you all about it. I get way too excited. 
I'm that guy who's pointing this thing at all the plants. Yeah, I'm that guy. It's my COVID crazy. So you're right. Much of what we see, especially in landscaped houses and like houses, but there's a movement too to um, replant local local stuff. Here we go. We got about, just to let you know, we got about a few more slides up. So the first Europeans rolled around South America, came up the west coast of the Americas, um, came up and saw obviously Baja California, which is separated from the coast of Mexico, and couldn't really tell if California ended. So the first Europeans imagined California as an island. And in their imaginations, they also imagined, well, they named California after Calafia. Calafia was the fictional queen of the Amazonian women. Right, have we talked about the, Am the, uh, the, the legend of the Amazon women in our class yet? No. <clears throat> All right, so Californians, California is named after Calafia. What is the legend of the Amazon women? No, no, Emma Monique from my other classes. I forget if we talked about this. Justin or Lee? Uh, it's a it's a Greek legend about a like a matriarchal society that I think was uh, based in reality off some uh, Persian warrior women. Kind of, it was kind of based on the women of Crete, C R E T E, in my understanding. But it's it's a made up dude thing. Dudes made it up about this island of warrior women who only used men to have sex with them and then they would kill them, right? And this was a big popular legend, right? And, and many sailors were like, man, we gotta find that island. Um, so Calafi, and by the way, if you all know, um, remember, I could be lying to you. So if you all know like the actual roots of where the Amazon legend comes from. I know it's a Greek one, but it's interesting to hear the Persian connections to you. That you I've just heard something about... Um, just send these, me a, I love to be sent uh, evidence. I love it. About like, uh, I think they were mounted archers. Like yeah, a mixed that unit. Would the, uh, that would be the... Uh, I think they're talking about Crete. C-R-E-T-E. -E, the Minoans. The Minoans of Crete. All right, so by the early 1800s, we're jumping ahead. California, which is right here, was contested. Not only did, you know, half a million Native Americans live there, a little less by this time, excuse me. Um, you had Russians coming in from the north, right? You had British who claimed all of this stripy area up here. This is all British claims, the pink stripy salmon stuff. And then the Spanish, as you know from chapter four in Alan Taylor's The Spanish Frontier, the Spanish claim the Southwest here. It was called New Spain, Nueva España. <clears throat> and we haven't even got to the American settlers who were gonna come from the East in about 40 years. And why were the Russians coming all the way down the coast? What were they doing? Just like chilling and cruising? What were the, uh, what resource were they seeking? Y'all know? As they came down the coast? What resource were they seeking? Monique, can I pick on you? Um, I'm not sure. Maybe gold? Okay, no, I'll get there. No, I'm just picking on you. Thank you for being a good sport. Um, let me show you the map first. <clears throat> so beginning in the late 1700s and really ramping up in the 1800s, the whole Pacific theater, and you know what, historians are just starting to write books about this, and it's fascinating. Uh, Rush, the Russian Empire is expanding down on the west coast of the Americas. Hawaii is becoming a regular spot to stop since Captain Cook, the British mariner Captain Cook, went there. Um, so the Pacific is becoming a regular place for traders, and not necessarily colonists at this time, but to traders to trade the goods of the sea. <clears throat> and California became a very busy entreport. Look at, here's a ship with a British flag and they're trading here. Here's the, uh, the trading post with the British flag, probably the Hudson Bay Company. And here, native peoples trading with the British and others. <clears throat> In fact, Fort, Fort Vancouver, which is on the Oregon-Washington border, 
was the uh, Western headquarters of um, the British Hudson Bay Company. And the number thing, here's my answer to you uh, when I was picking on you, Monique. They're trading in furs, 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 furs. Furs were being exported to Europe. People were making um, beaver furs and otter furs. And on one hand, it was a style thing. On the other hand, it served as waterproof um, stuff. They didn't have all that fancy, you know, Gore-Tex stuff we have here at, our, at the REI or wherever. So it was waterproof, it was utilitarian, but it was also um, for fashion. Uh, the whole Russian fort, if you've ever been to Sonoma County, right near the Jenner River, um, there's the Russian Fort Ross, and this was the center of the Russian fort trade, fur trade, I'm sorry, fur trade. And if you go there, it still has the Russian styled uh, minarets, those onion shaped dome things at the top. It's pretty cool. Oh, should I show you something shocking? Yeah, that's my job. Right, and what they found was the seals were really easy to hunt because they would not run away. They had not learned to run away in numbers from humans, right? So they were just these nasty, you know, sad for us seal hunts, right? Oh, Lee's eyes say it all, huh, Lee? Isn't that sad? Monique's not even looking like, no, I don't even wanna look. That's too sad. Um, however, the fur trade made um, between furs, otters, whales, uh, made the Russian Empire super rich, made the Hudson Bay Empire super rich, and many folks, fur trading was the number one initial resource that brought folks here. And the numbers plummeted, the numbers of all of those things plummeted. Okay, last chapter in this lecture. Um, what do you all know about the California missions? Have you all ever been to one? Visited a California mission? They're all pretty far south of us. Which one did you visit, Lee? I have, I have no idea, but I know uh, when I was a kid, my parents drove around going to them. I remember when I was in fourth grade, they made us do a mission, make a mission, right? And you had to build it and bring it to school and promise that your dad didn't help you build it, that whole thing, right? Monique and Emma and Justin, do you all have to build a mission in elementary school? No? Okay. See, things have changed. I had to. I had to. I had to do it when I was a kid. Did you? All right. Justin, yes. Emma, yes or no? Yeah. Yeah, I had to. All right. Monique's school is a bit... So let me tell you about uh, building a mission. Let's see if we want to have kids build the missions after you hear this, and maybe they'll add some certain things. <clears throat> um, so as you read about in Chapter 4, you all read about missions here in the New Mexico area, right? But we're going to be focusing on the 21 or so missions up that were built up and down California. Okay. And one of the, like they call them the godfather of the missions, the Franciscan friar who headed up the Spanish church's effort to expand into the north. And he also had soldiers with him. So preachers and soldiers came north in the 1770s and built missions. And the saying was, you uh, one day's walk was about 20 miles or so, a little less sometimes. And they built the missions one day's walk apart from each other, right? That might be a little of exaggeration, but that's the story goes. So there's 21 missions in California covering 600 miles. Here's the one I grew up closest to in eastern LA County in, in eastern Los Angeles, right? Like Pasadena's over here. Right, Monrovia, where I grew up, is right about there. This is the San Gabriel Mission. The San Gabriel was one of the wealthiest missions. It produced a lot of wine, one of the first successful wine producing places for the Spanish in the San Gabriel Valley. Um, what was the mission of the mission from your Alan Taylor reading? What was the mission of the missions? What were they meant, what were they built and meant to do? Uh, forcibly convert natives. Forcibly convert natives, yep. And I'm going to add something else that Alan Taylor didn't talk about as much. Any other gift? Forcibly convert? Anything else? No. no uh, enslave the people that they couldn't convert. <laughs> yep. So think about that next time you when you're teaching fourth grade, Emma. No, you're going to teach high school, right? Is that what you said? I forget. Hey, if you all want to teach, teach college. Then you don't have to do with parents. All right, 
So the mission of the missions, here's a drawing of a mission on the coast, I forget which one, was to be sort of the, wed the front wedge of Spanish settlement and also an Indian labor camp. Remember, the Spanish needed laborers. So as Emma said, was to enslave the Indians? Yep, because the Spanish needed laborers. There weren't enough Spanish up there to labor, and it was culturally many Spaniards saw laboring in the fields as below them. Not all of them, but that was just the cultural norm. So, and also to keep the Russians and the English out, right? So their European comp competition, keep them out. And also to convert and civilize the gente sin razón. The gente sin razón means people without reason. This was their racist uh, designation for anybody who wasn't Christian was a person without reason. So that was the mission of the missions. Let me tell you a story. The Yukats, the Yukats are a, a people near um, San Luis, a visit near San Jose. So the Franciscans, along with some soldiers, went and captured or kidnapped a Yukat family. The family was forced to go to the San Jose mission. And at the mission, a young boy was born in 1800, and the boy was baptized as Stanislao. Stanislao, Stanislao. Does that name ring a bell for you California people? Stanislaus? Stanislaus County, yeah, it's a county in central eastern California named after him, Stanislaus. So this young boy Stanislaus, Stanislao, how about I just call him Stan? This young boy Stan <clears throat> rose up into the ranks. He was a really smart young guy. He ended up being like one of the leaders of the mission Indians. He was a neophyte, meaning he was a converted Indian. And his job ended up to be to enforce civilized life among the other Indians, those who wouldn't behave. Right. And the, one of the ways in which they enforce civilized life is no more hunting and gathering. Now you went and plowed the fields and farmed. You had to not speak your language. You had to speak Spanish. You had to eat three meals a day. You had to go to church. You had to have um, sex with only one person. That would be your wife. OK, so these things we spoke about when I lectured about the Pueblo revolt or you read about in chapter four in Alan Taylor. He Stanislaw was the enforcer. So when native peoples did come to the missions, I just like showing you these images. Um, these drawings are of Europeans drawing native people when they first come to the mission. They're still playing their, uh, this gambling game, right? And here they are still not civilized yet, but to put in quotes. Um, here are uh, natives who just arrived at the mission dancing, right? And they've yet to be civilized. But once they were there for a spell, uh, the boys and girls were separated, separated at night. They were locked in their rooms. There was harsh punishment if they misbehaved. And this is the same way kids were treated in Europe, right? It was, um, they're not treated much differently. They were whipped, shackled, or imprisoned if they misbehaved. They were hunted down if they fled. <clears throat> and this was just the mission life for many of them, and they were forced to work. Meanwhile, uh, Spaniards had also brought with them pigs and cattle, right? Um, food on the hoof. And the pigs and cattle just boomed. The population boomed in California. Um, the Spanish outlawed the um, Indians catching the forest on fire. The Spanish were scared of that. They outlawed it because they wanted the pasturage to be for these large livestock to graze on. And what ended up happening, this produced a lot of um, tallow, uh, cattle products, right? Let me get rid of her. Cattle products. Californians, California's main export during this time was cattle hide and cattle wax, the tallow, the fat um, rendered into candles. You know whose population exploded in California after all these pigs and cows are roaming the landscape? What can you imagine? What big predator in California was like, oh, yum. Because remember, cattle and pigs aren't that hard to hunt. So what's like the top predator, apex predator in California at this time? Cougars. Which one? Cougars. All right, what's on our flag? The bear. Oh, yeah, not only any bear, the grizzly bear. 
right? So um, <clears throat> there were herds of grizzly bear roaming California um, before the 1800s, herds of them, right? They were usually not solitary animals. So could you imagine a herd of grizzly bear rolling up the Sacramento River, right? Here's the kind that lived in the Sacramento River, Colossus, Colossus, big ones. Actually, the biggest ones were these ones down in the pink, Magistars, down near like the, um, the Cleveland National Forest in eastern San Diego down here. The grizzly population boomed because they were just feasting on all these cattle and pigs and everything else. So you know what the Spanish started to do in mass? Hunt the grizzly. Get rid of them. And they were very successful at it. Um, the last grizzly in California was reportedly killed in Fresno County in 1922. And now our mascot on our flag no longer lives here. Pretty crazy. About a month ago, I went to Montana and saw a couple of grizzlies and they are big. Man, they're big. All right, enough about grizzlies. <clears throat> so I have about four slides left. Y'all with me, any questions? Y'all good? Okay, my point here is that the California landscape changed radically from having grizzly and elk roaming it to having domesticated large livestock, um, horses, cattle, sheep, and pigs on it, right? A transformation of the California livestock. No more, no, no more wolves, no more grizzly, very a uh, lot fewer elk. So fast forwarding to the late 1770s, it was what us historians call the age of revolution. Right, rebels in Haiti kicked out the French. Rebels in France got rid of the king and queen. And rebels in, on the east coast of the United States got rid of the British, right? Word comes to California that there's all these people who are being repressed by empires. So who do you all think in California is gonna start to rebel against the man? Take a guess, Lee, I see you nodding your head. What do you ask? Who in California is going to follow this lead and rebel against the oppressors? Uh, the people being horribly enslaved? Yeah, there was numerous Native American revolts. Numerous. And this is just starting to be writ written about, by the way. The biggest one was down here in Yuma. But you're going to read about a big Chumash rebellion over here in Santa Barbara in chapter one of the book. Right? Rebellions up and down because they heard, and also they were being treated poorly, that other people around the world were rebelling against this as well. Why did they rebel? For obvious reasons. A priest noted that, quote, Indians live well, free, but as soon as we reduce them to a Christian and community life, they fatten, sicken, and die. So remember that guy I told you, Stan, who was the head, like, police guy at the San Jose Mission? In 1928, Stan ran away, revolted, and he had quickly a following of 40,000 natives, many of them who ran away and many others who were <clears throat> never went to the missions. Um, these major California Indian revolts erupted in various places and at various times from 1775 to 1826, all right, and just erupted. And this is what actually led to the demise of the Spanish mission system. Um, you might hear other stories why the Spanish mission system went away in the 1830s, and I'll get into that later, but it was largely because the Native Americans refused to work, and then they were dying in big numbers at these missions. Okay. So, questions or comments about the lecture? <clears throat> By the way, this is a statue, a very heroic statue of Estanislao. Out, it says Chief Estanislao at the bottom. I don't know if you can see it. Right outside the Stanislaus County Courthouse. So if you ever have to go pay a ticket or go to court in the Stanislao, in the Stanislaus Courthouse, give him a high five on the way in. All right. Um, let me just go. Justin, what struck you about this lecture? Any old thing, or do you have any questions? <clears throat> 